Late to the party as usual. I've got the Fossey, 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 Fossey Bear uh, ZA3 little desktop type amplifier. Now I paid for this myself. I ordered it from Amazon and the idea is that I'll just give it to somebody when I'm done with it. Uh, about 150 bucks for this guy with the 48 volt power supply. Now keep in mind, the power supply is about half the size of the amplifier itself. Now, you may not care about that. Personally, I don't either. It would be neat if it was somehow incorporated into this, but in doing so, they keep the noise level down and I'm okay with that. You know, you just tuck it off to the side, put it on the floor, or maybe use it as a doorstop. Do whatever you want with it. Now you'll notice we've got a couple switches on the front and a volume knob or a gain knob or an input sensitivity adjustment, whatever you want to call this thing. Basically, we all know this is a volume knob. Now my car audio friends are going to say, a gain is not a volume knob. <laughs> Okay, kind of is. Um, the XLR, I should put it by the back. Uh, the XLR on the back input and then RCA inputs as well can be switched on the front. I like that. And then let's see here. Oh, we also have mono and stereo mode. So this is two channel output, but it can be used as mono. So you just switch right there. The thing about the mono mode with this amplifier is that it does not double the output power of the two channels, right? So it's not bridged mono, it's just mono, and it gives a little bit more power to the single output, which is this guy right here. Another thing that I want to point out is it has a subwoofer output. Now that's pretty cool, except I'm going to show you why it's not pretty cool in the measurement section of this video you can get another version of this amplifier with a lower voltage power supply. So power wise, you get more output power with the 48 volt power supply that comes with the version that I bought. Now, if we look at the ratings together on here, we can see that there are two separate sets of ratings and then two separate sets of ratings between that and then two separate sets of ratings between mono and stereo. So we're gonna focus on this section right here, the 48 volt five amp, which is what I have. They say stereo mode per channel at 1% THD at 4 ohm is 180 watts, 8 ohm is 95 watts. Mono mode, 4 ohm, 235, 8 ohm, 120. That should be adequate to drive pretty much any speaker within a reasonable sized room or listening distance. And in my case, I'm listening in an 18 by 14 by 9 foot ceiling room at about 10 feet away. Now I've listened to a few different speakers from PSB Audio's Imagine B5, B50 bookshelf speaker to PS Audio's FR10 tower speaker, as well as the MoFi Source Point 10, as well as the ELAC Vela BS403, because these are all speakers that I have on hand. I didn't have any issues driving these speakers to adequate output levels at again 10 feet away in a what i would consider maybe a medium-sized room the interesting thing though is that in the measurements there seems to be a head scratcher i'm gonna save that for a little bit and we'll talk about that in a little bit with those speakers in that room at that distance it was okay it did what it needed to do at this point there are already so many other reviewers that have talked about this amplifier and they've given you subjective opinions that I don't really want to waste my time. Number one, because they've already done it. But number two, which really overrides number one is when it comes to subjective performance or subjective analysis, like, you know, I think I heard a lush bottom end. This amplifier is more transparent than this one. A lot of the times these guys aren't doing blind testing. They're not doing back to back AB or ABX testing even. And they're not even level matching between amplifier outputs. So I really take subjective opinions about how electronic sound with less than a grain of salt. Is a grain of sand smaller than a grain of salt? Because if it is, that's what I take it with. Personally, I rely on objective measurements to tell us, is the amplifier performing the way it's supposed to? Does it have flat frequency response? Does it meet the power? Can it drive this speaker at this particular resistance or ohm load? 
What I'm going to start with is frequency response. How does this amplifier react when a speaker is attached to it or a static load is attached to it? So what I do for my testing is I test with two different static loads, a four and an eight ohm, and then I test with two reactive loads, a simple and a complex. Now these reactive loads are designed to emulate a real speaker. The reason I don't use a real speaker for this test is because I test at different output levels and I don't want to potentially blow a speaker or blow out my eardrums. If you want to know more about these reactive loads, I will have it on my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com in this review. First of all, the eight ohm and the four ohm static loads. Eight ohm is in red, four ohm is in blue. Let's look at those. Frequency response from 10 Hertz to about 22, 23 kilohertz or so. And I've measured at 48 kilohertz sampling rate. What we have with the eight ohm is an increase of about maybe six to seven tenths of a decibel, tenths of a decibel. And at 10 kilohertz, it's about three tenths of a decibel up. Basically what's happening with an eight ohm resistance, you're gonna be increasing the output at higher frequencies. And with a four ohm resistance, you're gonna be decreasing the output at higher frequencies. But these trends, are they gonna be audible? Possibly, but most likely not. And this is where I find that complex loads really help us better understand what is gonna happen, what most likely is gonna happen in terms of audibility. Because we can talk all day about, I heard X, Y, or Z, most of the time I'm gonna believe that whoever's saying it is full of crap unless they can show me some measurements or some proof as to how they heard what they heard and it should be easy to prove. So with these different reactive loads, starting with the simple in green, we can see that around three kilohertz there's about a half a decibel bump and then it swings pretty quickly to about a quarter decibel at five kilohertz and then it swings pretty, pretty high again uh, at around, let's say centered about 14 kilohertz of about maybe seven tenths of a decibel. Now, what about a more complex load? Something that has a lower ohm rating and then has a little bit higher resistance depending on the frequency. That's in orange. The thing that I wanna note about these swings are that they're pretty broad. Now, if you have a very narrow filter, it's gonna be harder to hear that. But when it's very broad, it's gonna bring more attention to that range of frequencies. So if we look at this big bump, we've got a range from about three to around, I think that's about 14 kilohertz or so, but I'm gonna round down to make this math easy. Three to 12 kilohertz is two octaves. You go three to six and then six to 12. So you double that range twice. So that's two octaves where you have about 0.7 point, yeah, about 0.7 decibels of total amplitude modulation. Are you gonna hear that? Yeah, I think so. I think out of all of these, a complex load is most likely to be heard. But this also goes to show us that you could possibly, now I'm not saying you will, but you could possibly hear a difference with different speakers. And that's what we call load dependency. Now let's move on to the subwoofer. When you plug in an RCA to the subwoofer output, what do you think is gonna happen? What do you want to happen? Now, if you're like me, what you would want to happen is you would want for the amplifier or whatever you're using, DAC, preamp, whatever, to say, oh, you've got a subwoofer plugged in. That means I can attenuate the main speakers. I can add a high pass filter to them. And that way it takes the load off the main speakers and applies that frequency band to the subwoofer only. But what you get with this Fosse ZA3 amplifier is that it doesn't do that. Instead, as this graphic shows, when the subwoofer is engaged, this is the response of the subwoofer. Now this is not variable. You can't change the frequency of the crossover. This is fixed. It goes down about negative three dB. Is it about, let's say 180 Hertz or so. As you can see in the red line, this is the response of the speaker outputs when the subwoofer is engaged. And notice this is flat all the way down to 10 Hertz. Now, what does that mean? That means when you plug a subwoofer in, the main speaker outputs are not attenuated. They do not have a high pass filter applied to them, which then means that your main speakers are still playing down to 20 Hertz, down to 10 Hertz. And your subwoofer is also playing that, which honestly to me seems really silly. It entirely defeats the purpose of having a subwoofer pre-out at least in my opinion. If you're curious what the subwoofer pre-out voltage is, I'd say I'm about half a volt RMS output 
So now let's talk about power. And I ran into something that was kind of interesting through my testing. When I test, I test with a certain stimulus length, 64K FFT size. I do same thing as I did for frequency response. I do eight ohm, four ohm, a simple reactive load and a complex reactive load. And that's what I'm showing you here in this graphic. Eight ohm is in red. We can see that we hit about 100 and maybe 10 watts or so before the distortion starts to ramp up pretty, pretty quickly. Now this is both channels driven at the same time. I'm only showing the result for the right channel. The eight ohm rating is 95 watts at one kilohertz THD of 1%. So let's go up to 1%. Eight ohm, hey, that actually, that actually does better. Oh, that's kind of cool. All right, cool, yeah. So what happens with four ohm? Now four ohm is rated at, let me look here, 180 watts at 1%. Okay, now that's, this says stereo mode per channel. Four ohm is in this light blue and we can see that it's ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. And then you get to about maybe 105 watts or so. And then pew, it shoots over this way. Well, what happened? It went into protect. So why is it only 105 watts? Well, I thought that was really weird. I mean, like it's supposed to be 180 watts. I've seen somebody else's measurements that show that it definitely goes above 105 watts at four ohm with both channels driven. So what's up with that? Huh, I don't know. Well, then I started doing some investigation and it took me about two days to realize what was going on. But let me show you. If you test with a different stimulus length, and in this case, it's about 8K stimulus length or 8K FFT, the difference between 8K and 64K is basically 8K would be like boop, 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 and it just go boop, 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 and it's pretty quick. With 64, it kind of hangs on to that stimulus a little bit longer. So it's like, boop, boop. All right, so like, it's like that, right? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Anyway, I hope you get the point. So with that said, let's look at four ohm now with a shorter stimulus length. Four ohm, same color in this light blue. And look, it, it, it ramps up and we get to about maybe 150 or so, or something like that uh, before it ramps up and hits that knee. And then at 1%, I'd say we're probably maybe like 160 or so. So it's it's kind of close to their rating. But it's interesting that now with the shorter stimulus length, I'm hitting close to what the manufacturer says. But with that longer tone, I'm definitely not. And it goes into protect and the amplifier shuts down. So when you're comparing my results to other people's results, maybe keep that in mind. What happens if I switch this thing over to mono mode? At eight ohm, I'm hitting about, I don't know, maybe one... 15 or so watts, I guess. And then at four ohm, it's hitting about 190 or so. Now they say the four ohm rated is 235 at 1% THD. Yeah, maybe I'd give it to them. I mean, that's kind of close. And at eight ohm, the rating is 120 watts at 1% THD. In the audio industry, it's very common for people to test with just one tone to figure out maximum power. And the THD versus frequency and the THD versus power that you've seen me talk about before, it's almost always with one kilohertz. That's just how it's done. What I like to do is kind of go a step beyond that. So what I'll do is I'll test at low power with a one kilohertz tone, and then I'll implement a multi-tone signal into that and see if I'm achieving the same power. Then I ramp the output up until I get to close to rated power with a single kilo, one kilohertz tone. And then I'll do a multi-tone with that and see, am I getting the same power or am I getting less? Now with the NAD C3050, that worked out. I was getting the same power, which means that the power supply was very robust and it could deliver the same amount of power across all sorts of frequencies as it could with just one tone. That's what you want. Their rated power is 95 watts at 1%, which actually I achieved better than that, but I'm gonna to go to that point and we're gonna see what happens. But first what we need to do is do a low power sanity check. Pay attention up here. So this is gonna be the input stimulus, 100 millivolts RMS into the amplifier. And this is gonna be the power out at eight ohm. I'm gonna hit run for a one kilohertz tone and I get 1.2 watts output right here at eight ohm. So now if I switch over to multi-tone with that same input, I wanna get the same power that we just got. Oh cool, 1.22 watts. So basically the same power that we just got. Now what this tells me is that at lower power, regardless if I'm feeding it just a single tone or a slew of tones like maybe music would have, then it achieves the same power output. Now if I ramp this thing up to a, a point where it hits about 95 watts or so, 95 watts at two dBV or 1.25 volt RMS. So I'm gonna take two dBV and I'm gonna type it into multi-tone, two, 
And I want to hit, remember, 95 watts. Let's see, do we do that? Ooh, I lost, and now we're down to 77. So I've lost about 18 watts at 8 ohm. All right, okay, all right. So we did lose power with an 8 ohm load. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do all this with a 4 ohm load. Now, if we go back to the graphic that I showed you earlier, where it just kind of dies around about 105 or so watts, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about first, okay? Okay, I'm at 60 watts with about 0.7 volts input. Pay attention here because something funky is about to happen. I'm at 75 watts, 93 watts. Okay, cool. Oh, what happened? The signal just dropped off. The amplifier went into protect. And now what I'm gonna to have to do is reset the amplifier. So hold on. All right, I'm at about 94 watts with a one kilohertz tone, and I'm gonna switch it over to multi-tone using the same input voltage. So let me turn this off. Turn this to minus, I'm gonna start with minus three. I'm gonna walk into it. Non minus one is where I need to be to get 95 watts. All right, minus three, I'm at 57. Now minus two, what happens? 71, all right, so now I'm gonna go to minus one, it needs to be 95, minus one, 86. So I'm about nine watts or so off from the point where the amplifier went into protect maximum output, which was 95 watts. Still, it shouldn't have gone into protect, it should have been able to deliver more power. They rate this at 180 watts per channel in stereo mode at four ohm, and I was able to achieve about half of that, which closely aligns with this value. So to recap what I just showed you, at eight ohm, both channels driven, the maximum that I went up to was 95 watts because that's what they rate this at. When I applied multi-tone, I lost about 18 watts. When I try to do the same thing with a four ohm load, I cannot achieve the maximum power that they rate this at. Now, the truth of the matter is that these measurements give us insight into the fact that the amplifier doesn't do what it's supposed to do for the four ohm static load, but I used four different speakers of varying sensitivity and varying complexity in their overall impedance presented to the amplifier. And I was able to drive them without going into protect and to get loud enough levels where I was satisfied in a medium sized room at 10 feet away. I think my main issue as far as real world goes, I mean, outside of the measurements, right? Outside of the measurements and it kind of having issues with four ohm load, my main issue is the subwoofer output. I don't know why in the world anybody would have a subwoofer output and not high pass the mains. There's, listen, I've been doing this for a long freaking time. I get people want to do gain overlap or people want to do crossover overlap, I should say. And, and it gives them a sense of, it, look, you can even argue that we can talk about distributed base modes and things like that, but that's, that's horse hockey. The purpose for having a subwoofer is to alleviate the load of your mains. So when you plug in a subwoofer, I want to see a high pass filter implemented. So that's my request to Fozzie. That's my time with the Fozzie. My overall recommendation is, you know, like biggest issue subwoofer output, 150 bucks. Maybe you want to buy it. I don't know. If you do still want to buy it after watching this review, I will have an affiliate link in the comment section below. Feel free to use that. It helps me out with a small commission. It's like 4%. So four times 15 is I can't math, but maybe six bucks or so is what I would earn off of it. Uh, you don't have to buy it. Personally, if you can swing the Wii Amp, I would go that route, but I realize they're not the same thing. The Wii Amp has streaming and HDMI built into it and all that stuff. For double the price, it's definitely worth it. But if you're really looking for just a small desktop amp, this will do the job. Just don't plug a subwoofer into it thinking you're going to high pass the mains. I know I'm harping on that, but it's probably like one of the most annoying features that I've ever seen somebody implement into an amplifier that has subwoofer output. It just seems silly to me. So that's my honest sake. And if you don't like it, let me know in the comment section below. I'm sure you will. I will talk to y'all later. Oh, and if you want to join me at patreon.com, please do so. Uh, that helps support me, helps me keep this channel going, helps me afford to buy these kind of things to test. And I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.